Stanford University. So I'm going to uh, talk today about uh, kind of how to power the world with uh, clean renewable energy, namely wind, water, and sunlight. And we'll look at a lot of issues and I'll explain, but I want to start by asking, well, why is there a problem and what, why do we actually have to do anything quickly? And so I'll show a little bit on climate change just for a couple minutes. Um, first, temperatures are rising rapidly. Arctic sea ice is decreasing quickly. Uh, air pollution mortality is one of the five leading causes of death worldwide, and higher temperatures contribute to deaths. Uh, higher populations and growing energy demand will result in worsening air pollution and climate problems over time. So these are kind of motivation. In terms of just some data on global temperatures, kind of you've all seen a record like this. This is 1880, the land surface temperature record, and nine out of the 10 warmest years uh, on the land surface record are in the last 10 years, and including 2010, which was tied for the warmest. Uh, sea ice is dwindling, the Arctic sea ice that is, is dwindling pretty rapidly. And this is the 1979, well the 1979 to 2000 mean uh, is 15.6 million square kilometers of sea ice. And this shows uh, the sea ice extent in January from 1979 to 2011. You can see it's kind of steadily declining. And this is one of the reasons we have to act quickly is because sea ice is rapidly dis uh, being destroyed and as you uh, decrease the sea ice, you uncover the low albedo ocean below. And so you result, that results in a positive feedback of warming, so you accelerate the, the warming that's occurring uh, because you no longer have a highly reflective sea ice surface and snow surface. You have a low albedo reflective, uh, non-reflective ocean surface. And this triggers warming of the ocean and, and faster warming of, of the circulation of the uh, ocean and the, and the planet. Now, air pollution is uh, something that's even a more uh, drastic problem in the short term and possibly the long term. Just, I'll give you some examples just through some photographs. This is uh, Nor-Ilsk, Russia. You can see air pollution is pretty heavy. Uh, Sukhinda, India. These are all recent photographs. Um, here's uh, Linfen, China. China has like 16 of the, 10 most, 16 of the 20 most uh, polluted cities in the world. And living in this city is like smoking three packs of cigarettes a day and has the highest child mortality rate in the world. And if you lived in Los Angeles in the 1970s, uh, well, I'll, actually I'll show the next slide. This is uh, actually, um, this shows a satellite image over China and it just looks like uh, one uh, big barbecue pit because of the, this is all pollution. I mean, it's all air pollution. It's called the Asian brown cloud. It's not only over China, it's all over Southeast Asia. And the, the darkness of, these, of this pollution is a contributor to warming too. So it's not only carbon dioxide that causes global warming, but it's also black carbon and, and brown carbon, which are aerosol particle components that absorb sunlight. The black carbon absorbs all wavelengths of light, so it appears black and brown carbon absorbs preferentially uh, blue and some green wavelengths, so it appears brown. And, that's, and that enhances the warming. Actually, per unit mass, it's a million times more warming than carbon dioxide. But there's a lot more carbon dioxide in the air than black carbon. And also, the lifetime of this, the, the particles is very short, like on the order of a week to three weeks. So actually, it's the, the only way you could actually slow down the sea ice loss is by reducing the the soot emissions that result in black carbon and organic carbon uh, because it takes too long to read, even though if you eliminate all the carbon dioxide today, uh, it'll take 30 to 50 years to go to reduce the concentration in the atmosphere by down to 37% or one lifetime of carbon dioxide. Whereas if you reduce all the soot today, you can eliminate it, uh, the atmospheric burden within a few months to a year. And as a result, you can have a rapid cooling. The total cooling due to all the soot in the world, the black carbon and the organic carbon, is it's a contributor to about 16 or 17 percent of global warming. Carbon dioxide is about 45 percent. So you can eliminate, you know, the good 16, 17 percent of all global warming by eliminating all the soot particles, and you can save a lot of people's lives because air pollution particles kill two and a half to three million people per year. Now, 
as I was mentioning, if you lived in Los Angeles in the 1970s, uh, or if you live in most uh, cities of the world today, this is what your lungs would look like uh, if you were a non-smoker teenager. And this is from a teenage non-smoker from Los Angeles in the 1970s. And this is the equivalent air pollution to what you see uh, today in most cities of the world outside of North America and Europe uh, because the pollution is so bad. Now, this is due mostly to particulate matter. And I just want to point out every 10 micrograms per meter cubed of particulate matter in the atmosphere in the yearly averages reduces your life five to 10 months. So the average particulate matter concentration in this room is probably 15 to 20 micrograms per meter cubed. And this shows the particulate matter concentrations uh, by year in different parts of California. Here's South Coast, which is actually not the highest anymore. You can see the Central, the, um, Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, has the highest particulate matter concentrations on the order of up to, sorry, these are not average, by the way. So these are the maximums, not the average. But the, the uh, maximums in the Central Valley are higher now than in Los Angeles. Um, we're down the San Francisco Bay Area. We're, you know, we're moderately low in terms of the maximum. The averages are lower than this, but they're not. They're on the order of uh, between 20 in, in the Bay Area, probably around 20 uh, micrograms per meter cubed. Anyway, so these are not. Uh, on general, particulate matter is decreasing, uh, but it's increasing in a lot of places, uh, so, and a lot depend. I mean, in the United States and Europe, but in most of the rest of the world, as I showed from those photographs, it's actually going up, and more and more people are dying. So about two and a half to three million people die every year from air pollution, and California, about eighteen thousand people die every year, with a range of fifty six hundred to twenty three thousand. And that's premature deaths due mostly just to uh, PM 2.5. And in the US, it's 50 to 100,000 deaths per year. In Europe, it's about 300 to 350,000 deaths per year. So this, this is a goal to eliminate these mortalities. And these, of course, are all due uh, to combustion processes, uh, namely oil, gas, uh, coal, uh, biofuels, et cetera, anything that's burning and producing pollution in the air. Now, OK, so how do we solve this problem? Uh, the solution, well, we're starting by first step was to rank, look at and rank the different energy solutions to uh, proposed energy solutions to global warming and air pollution uh, problems. Uh, we wanted to rank them in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, air pollution mortality, water consumption, the footprint on the ground, and the total spacing of a technology. The resource abundance, uh, the ability to match peak demand uh, with supply of energy. So we looked, we tried to rank different energy technologies in terms of these uh, criteria without considering costs at first. And then looked at the second step is to evaluate replacing 100% of all energy with the best of technologies. So we first rank them, pick the best technologies, and see can we power the entire world uh, with these technologies, and then look at uh, costs as well as politics and uh, resources and materials. So that's what I'll talk about for the rest of this talk. So um, the options I'll look at first, and by the way, so it's, we're going to look at electricity <coughs> and transportation, but also uh, these technologies will also be applied to heating and cooling and commercial processes. So it's really for all purposes, we're going to look at trying to power the world. So the electricity options include wind, turbines, uh, photovoltaics, geothermal power plants, tidal turbines, wave devices, concentrated solar power, hydroelectric power, nuclear power, coal with carbon capture and sequestration. So we'll look at these to determine which ones of these are the best and which ones are not so good. And vehicle options, battery electric vehicles uh, powered by uh, any of these options, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, and then we'll look at a, a corn and cellulosic ethanol vehicles as well. And then I'll put these in context with other types of fuels or vehicles that, options that you might be interested in. And so just some pictures of these devices, you know, wind turbines, uh, just take, you take the kinetic energy of the wind and you convert it to electricity through a turbine. Uh, wave devices, take the up and down motion of the wave and convert that to electricity. Uh, hydroelectric power, take gravitational dropping of water, uh, send it through uh, to produce electricity through a turbine. Uh, geothermal power, which we call water. Uh, hot water from 
use hot you know, rocks or water from under the ground uh, to generate electricity in a power plant such as this. And uh, through, through evaporating water and producing uh, electricity through a turbine. Here's a, a tidal turbine, which is really similar to a wind turbine, but just under the water. Uh, concentrated solar power, where you focus light on a uh, on a mirror on mirrors to heat up a fluid, and then the fluid is uh, then transferred to uh, water near. So it goes next to water and heats up the water to produce water vapor that drives a, a turbine to generate electricity. Uh, solar photovoltaic power plants. The other no, another option also we'll look at rooftop solar as well. Uh, then in terms of vehicles, electric. Vehicles such as the Tesla Roadster, here's the Nissan Leaf, here's the Tesla Model S, and also uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So here's a hydrogen fuel cell bus. This is a this is an electric truck that exists can go about 140 miles, um, and this is a hydrogen electric hybrid bus. So technologies that uh, exist today, we're going to look at those as opposed to those that might exist in 20 years or so. Uh, here's some more. Here's a hydrogen fuel cell ship. Uh, this is an electric ship uh, from the Navy. Uh, there's a tractor that runs on hydrogen, and then this is a hydrogen drawing for a hydrogen airplane. This one doesn't actually exist yet. Uh, but they, this would be liquefied hydrogen, just like in the space shuttle, uh, where you'd have a larger volume because hydrogen is so light, but it weighs less. And so the overall drag is pretty similar to uh, your current jet fuel planes. And so, and then for homes, for example, air source heat pumps, uh, air source heat pump water heaters for hot water, and this is for air conditioning and hot air, and then uh, solar hot water preheaters. Uh, so these are all technologies that exist. And see, we want to see, look at these technologies. Can we power the entire world uh, using them? Okay, so let's start by looking at the emissions associated with different electric power sources. And so these are the life cycle carbon dioxide emissions, or carbon dioxide equivalent. So these are all units of grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour. The carbon dioxide equivalent is basically converting any greenhouse gas, such as methane or nitrous oxide, uh, to the equivalent warming potential of carbon dioxide and then adding it to carbon dioxide. And so these are results that I compiled from other studies that give you the, the emissions of CO2 per kilowatt hour of the te electric power technologies. So if we start with over here, coal with carbon capture, you can see that's uh, relatively high. Well, with, without carbon capture, coal exhaust puts out about 900 to 1,000 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So with, and then, but there's the upstream production of the coal and transport of the coal, which is another 300 to 400 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So that doesn't actually change. You actually um, keep that with carbon capture. Uh, with carbon capture, you can reduce 85 to 90 percent of the carbon dioxide emissions from the exhaust, but you still have 15 percent plus all the upstream emissions. And also, you need about 25 percent more coal because uh, it takes 25 percent more energy to run the carbon capture equipment. So you end up still with quite a bit of CO2 emissions from coal with carbon capture. This is clean coal. Now, with nuclear power, uh, there are two estimates. The low estimate is the nuclear energy industry estimate. <laughs> and the high estimate is actually the average of about 102 scientific studies. So anyway, you can take your pick. But uh, this, is, this won't be the only carbon emissions. This is the carbon emissions that people generally look at, but they ignore the other carbon emissions I'll talk about in a minute. But anyway, so this is just to start uh, the nuclear emissions. Uh, hydro and wave and tidal, these are all relatively low. Uh, geothermal, these differences represent two different types of geothermal plants. Uh, the low number represents a, a binary plant where the uh, hot, the steam doesn't actually get released from the, uh, under the ground, doesn't get released to the air, so you don't re release any carbon dioxide dissolved in water. It's a closed system, and so the, the water goes back to the ground. And that's about 13% of, of all geothermal plants. And the high number represents those non-binary plants where the CO2 from the dissolved in the water gets released to the air. And so that represents the rest. So there's no reason you can't have all binary plants, but it's just from practice that hasn't been done so far. 
Uh, solar PV, uh, these numbers have come down quite a bit. There's a lot, it's pretty intense to produce solar uh, silicon uh, wafers. And as a result, this, um, the solar PV numbers depend a lot on where you put the solar, uh, but these numbers have come down quite a bit. A concentrated solar has less carbon emissions than solar PV, and wind uh, is pretty close and actually has the lowest of all of these. But it's, uh, and the, but this assumes the wind number assumes that the wind speeds have to be seven meters a second or faster, and using modern wind turbines. And so of course, if you use slower, uh, if you have slower wind speeds, then you'll get uh, less efficiency and higher CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour. Now that's one type of CO2 emissions, but when we're comparing different technologies, we also have to look at the CO2, em CO2 emissions associated with the planning to operation delays of the facility. So for example, with a nuclear plant, it takes 10 to 19 years uh, between planning and operation. And that includes a site permit time of 3.5 to 6 years, construction permit approval and issue time of 2.5 to 4 years, and then the construction time of 4 to 9 years. In world, worldwide right now, the construction times are about 7.2 years. So this is pretty right in, the, right in this range. So if you compare that, well, hydroelectric also takes a while, but the dams last quite long, like 80 to 100 years or more. Uh, coal with carbon capture, well, we know coal without carbon capture is about 6 to 11 years. We don't really know what it is with carbon capture because there isn't any. And then geothermal, it's about 3 to 6 years, and all the rest of these are about 2 to 5 years. So if we if we take, if we subtract the, um, the technologies with the least years, so two to five years, from those with the greater number of years, those are additional years where you're running the electric power grid while you're waiting for these technologies, the technologies to be put in place. So you have to account for that CO2 emissions. So when we add, when we look at those numbers, you get some additional carbon emissions associated with several of these technologies. So we add those to the previous CO2 emissions and we start to get a little more spread. And so coal with carbon capture still emits the most um, among these and nuclear is second. The rest of these are uh, pretty much lower. Okay, so let's then put these on a par with ethanol fueled vehicles. To, um, so let's take these electric options and then use them to produce electricity for battery electric vehicles or hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and compare those to cellulosic or corn ethanol fueled vehicles. So if we power the entire US vehicle fleet with one of these options, well the most CO2 reductions we can get are about 33%. So that's 26% from the exhaust of the vehicles and 7% from the production of the fuel. And so, uh, this shows a graph uh, of different technologies powering the vehicle fleet and the total reduction of CO2 emissions you get. And the most you can get is 33% reduction. So wind powering battery electric vehicles comes the closest. It's about you know, 32 points, you know, eight or, or, or six percent or so reduction. Anyway, a lot of these are pretty good. You start to get some separation with the nuclear and coal with CCS, but now you look at corn ethanol and cellulosic ethanol, and you can see right away, you know, well, historically, whenever you look at, um, when you hear about people talking about biofuels, they're always comparing them with gasoline or, or biodiesel with uh, regular diesel, not with other options. And so this actually compares the other options, and now you can see immediately why biofuels are completely, uh, cause a lot more air pollution and climate problems than these other options would. Because if you go to corn ethanol uh, per vehicle, the best you can do is maybe a 2% reduction per vehicle if you actually believe the best or most detailed studies. And that doesn't account for the land use change. If you go to account for land use change, then uh, some studies suggest that there's actually a doubling of the carbon emissions. But even if you don't, there's still no, not much benefit uh, compared with you know, all these other options where you do get a benefit. Cellulosic ethanol is basically the best type of ethanol in terms of the carbon emissions. As you can see, as we'll see from the air pollution emissions, it's not, it's not, it's actually worse than uh, corn ethanol. But the carbon emissions, you can get per vehicle up to a 50% improvement relative to gasoline. But even that gives, gets you here, and it's not even close to even coal with carbon capture or nuclear power. 
And that's without considering land use change. If you consider land use change, you could actually increase the CO2 emissions. So anyway, there's some, some number, there's some range here. And all the other biofuels fall in between the, these two. There's really nothing better than the cellulosic ethanol in terms of the biofuel. Sugarcane ethanol is going to be similar to that. If we go to biodiesel, it's going to be on this order as well in terms of the carbon balance. It's, it's not going to be an improvement down to any of these technologies. But these are just the, we're just looking at the beginning here. We're just looking at the carbon. Let's start looking at the air pollution problems. Now, so we looked at it, we did a study looking at uh, ethanol versus gasoline in terms of their uh, emissions and effects on health and air quality. And so here's some data showing the changes in emissions just from uh, one particular vehicle set, or set of vehicles, but these numbers are consistent across many vehicles. Uh, with ethanol versus gasoline, you increase organic gases on the order of 45%, you decrease oxides of nitrogen 30%. Now the ethanol industry just shows you the decrease of NOx of 30%. It'll show you the increase. And as we'll see, even the decrease of NOx is not a good thing in a lot of places. There's a decrease of benzene and butadiene, which the ethanol industry will tell you about. They don't tell you that you, that you increase acetaldehyde and formaldehyde by a factor of 45 and, and a factor of 2 either. And these are all, all four of these are carcinogens. But if you actually, this is kind of the only technical slide I'll show. I don't know if you can read it here. But uh, this is called an ozone isopleth, and it's used for regulatory con uh, control of ozone. And what it shows, these are organic gases on the bottom, so you increase your organic gases, you go to the right, and oxides of nitrogen, you, go, you increase them as you go upward. And these contours here are ozone. So as you go upward to the right on this diagram, that increases your ozone. So if you're at this point on the diagram, that means you're in somewhere like in Los Angeles where you have a high level of oxides of nitrogen in the background air relative to organic gases. And this shows that if you increase your organic gases, you increase your ozone. It also shows if you decrease your NOx, you increase your ozone. So in fact, if you increase your organics and decrease your NOx, you go this way and you increase your ozone. So without doing anything else, and just looking at the previous emissions change diagram or statistics, you should know that if you live in Los Angeles and you put ethanol fuel vehicles there, your ozone should go up without knowing anything else just from 50 years of experience using these ozone isoplus. So this is, this is just basic non-rocket science. This is, yet, yet the ethanol industry says that every city that they put the, uh, ethanol vehicles in, the air gets cleaner. Well, that's just because people have been using catalytic converters and gotten rid of all the cars without catalytic converters. Nothing to do with ethanol because you, as, you just, as you add ethanol, you should increase the ozone in, in places like Los Angeles. So here's simulations of this for Los Angeles for 2020. And indeed, you see this red increase, which is right in the center of Los Angeles. You get, if you converted all the vehicles, you'd increase your ozone, increasing the death rates by 9%, which is 120 additional deaths per year about. And over the US, though, you do get some decreases in the southeast, because in the southeast US, you're down here on the isopleth. And if you increase your organics, you don't really change your ozone. You decrease the NOx, then you do reduce the ozone. So in the southeast, you do get a benefit. However, there are not so many people live here as the rest of the country. So if you do an average over the whole US, you actually increase the death rates by about 4%. But the point is not the 4%. It's the point is it's on the same order as gasoline. You haven't re improved your air quality. And you've, it's about the same, maybe slightly worse. But it's just it's nothing close to reducing the air pollution that you can get from electric vehicles or hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, which eliminate all the air pollution from the exhaust. So let's put these in context. So here's 2020 with all these different technologies. Here's gasoline vehicles. Well, today there are about 25,000 deaths from, 20 to 25,000 deaths from vehicle exhaust uh, in the US each year, premature deaths. And in 2020, with improved uh, emission controls, it's ex estimated to be 15,000. If you go to corn ethanol or cellulosic ethanol, it'll be slightly higher. There's, uh, there's an increase not only due to the, o the ozone production, but also the upstream production of the fuel, because you can't put the ethanol in pipelines. You have to train truck and barge it around, so you have a lot more diesel uh, emissions from the trains, trucks, and barges. So anyway, it's on the same order as gasoline. But all these other technologies, you can see you can eliminate these mortalities 
effectively because there's, you know, you're not breathing in garbage coming out of a tailpipe. And however, when we look at nuclear, okay, so here's nuclear, uh, you know, it looks okay, it doesn't look too, too bad. But then we have to consider the risk. Well, if we wanted to power the world with nuclear energy, we would need, for, let's say we powered the whole world, we would need about uh, 15 or 16,000 uh, nuclear power plants, 850 megawatt nuclear power plants. And we have about 440 today. So even if we doubled that to you know, about 800 or so, that's about 5% of the total energy would be from nuclear. You'd increase the risk of nuclear weapons proliferation. Why is that? Because if we look historically, there are several countries that have secretly developed nuclear weapons capabilities uh, under the cover of nuclear power plants, including Iraq before 1982, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, North Korea, and, uh, and Iran. So that's at least five. And so if only one of these countries, you know, well, if you expand this, so many more countries in the world would get nuclear weapons. And if just one of them used it to develop a weapon and used it in a mega city, with, uh, then uh, the potential death rates over th averaged over 30 years of just one mega city being bombed, uh, you get more deaths than ethanol uh, averaged in scale to the US population. So that's a risk, and you don't know what that risk is. I mean, it's somewhere between zero and one, but it's, well, it's not zero. We know it's not zero, somewhere just above zero to one. Now with these other technologies, there's zero risk of that happening. Now speaking of risk, so that's, my concern is the weapons proliferation, but of course there's the nuclear um, meltdown poss uh, possibility. I mean about 2%, almost 2% of all nuclear reactors worldwide ever built have melted down. And so we've done, a, we've done some simulations of the, the release from, uh, Fukushima Daiichi, I want to show you the result, and I'll explain this. Well, I'll explain this first. This is a, a comparison of the model with data of cesium-137 in Sandpoint, Arkansas, which is, of course, further to the east of us. But just to give you an indication that the model actually is being, was able to predict this, these data quite well, you can see when they, this is between March uh, 12th or March 13th and April 4th, 2011. And you could see before the uh, 17th, not much uh, cesium was measured there. And then suddenly it jumped up and it's been pretty high uh, during this whole period. But I wanna show you the kind of the simulation and then put this in context. So this is just shows kind of where this plume is going and how, how it's spreading and from Japan and uh, kind of where it ends up. And you'll see that you know, this stuff gets mixed worldwide pretty quickly. And we calculate on the order of about 30 plus additional cancer deaths uh, due to this over this period of uh, about a month or so. And not, I mean, these are not an instantaneous deaths. These are over lifetime, lifetime increased cancer deaths and another about 70 uh, incidents of cancer that don't result in death. But you can see kind of how this spreads out worldwide. And so we're curious, well, what happens if this actually didn't occur here, but actually occurred on the Pacific coast of the US and how the, what would be the worldwide cancer risk of that? So that's to be determined. We don't have that, those results quite yet. But you can see this is um, marching forward on March, on April 3rd, April 4th. So it's pretty widespread and this cesium lasts uh, for quite a while before it gets removed. And this is in particulate matter form. There's also iodine uh, 131 we're also looking at, which is more in the gas phase. Um, but anyway, you can see how this, uh, these radionuclides spread worldwide pretty quickly. Okay, so let's look at an, another issue besides air pollution and carbon, the, the footprint. 
the footprint of different technologies is important. And there's, well, there's two different types of, of land use issues. One is footprint and one is spacing. So in the case of wind energy, uh, the footprint is really the, la the land being touched on the ground by the turbine and maybe any roads that are associated with it. Uh, and there's also spacing because you need to space the turbine sufficiently to prevent interference of one turbine with another. And these numbers are vastly different. For example, the footprint just of the turbine bases uh, to power the entire US vehicle fleet, you need about one to three square kilometers of footprint for about 73,000 to 140,000 five megawatt wind turbines. Whereas the spacing is about half a percent of the US. Uh, but that, as we'll see, that's pretty small compared to that, the area footprint needed for ethanol, which is about 15% of the US. Now, if we look at other technologies, like here's nuclear energy, uh, you have facilities that are covering the ground, so it has, actually has a much larger footprint physically touching the ground, not only for the facilities, but you have uranium mining here, for example, and uranium mining here. Now, if we look at the area required of the entire US for each of these, tech, well, several of these technologies to power all the US on-road vehicles. So this is cellulosic ethanol. There's a range here between five and 35% of the US. Uh, the 5% is the cellulosic ethanol industry estimate and 35% is the scientific uh, study estimate. Not mine, but other people's scientific study. So this is just kind of an average between them of around 20%. Uh, corn ethanol, there's a narrower range it's between 10 and 18%. And, but it's still quite a large area. Uh, for nuclear power, well, it's about the size of Rhode Island. Um, it's, not a, it's not a huge area, it's not a major issue in terms of the area, except for the fact that, of course, when you do have a meltdown, you pretty much uh, take up a lot more footprint in terms of land you can't use anymore. Now wind, wind, the footprint is actually the smallest of all energy technologies, this little red dot in the middle, uh, but you do need spacing. So it's about half a percent of the US to power the vehicle fleet. Um, of course, this could go offshore as I'll show in a minute. So it doesn't all have to be on land. Uh, then solar and geothermal, they also take uh, pretty small areas to power the whole US vehicle fleet. Um, they're, uh, smaller spacing areas than wind, but larger footprint areas. Okay, so, but again, I mean, the key things that stick out here again are the ethanols, the biofuels that just consume huge amounts of land in addition to producing huge amounts of pollution. Now, if we look at the East Coast, this is some work we're doing. Uh, Mike Dvorak, in particular, he's working on mapping the East Coast offshore wind resources, and here's some new results. Uh, so, if we look at uh, just locations where the wind, where the water is really shallow, relatively shallow, shallow uh, less than 200 meters depth, and there's also the 50 meter depths and 30 meter depth numbers here. Uh, there's about, if, and we then also pick only the fastest wind locations, uh, which are locations 8.8 .8 meters per second or faster, and we could go down to seven meters a second or faster. That's like what we've done for. Uh, on land, although it's more expensive offshore, so faster wind speeds are better. But if we just uh, limit it to 8.8 .8 meters per second and we exclude one third of the areas, uh, then there's enough power, there's about 173 gigawatts of deliverable power here, which is compared to 450 gigawatts of US electric power demand. So just if we take a limited amount of offshore East Coast wind resource, uh, there's a huge amount of power available near population centers uh, compared with the total US electric power demand. But I'll talk about world wind resources in a minute. Uh, the water consumption, so if we compare these technologies in terms of water, uh, on the right we have cellulosic ethanol and then we have corn ethanol. Again, these are producing uh, for energy for vehicles. Uh, we would need, the total US water demand is 150,000 gigagallons a year and we'd need about 10% of that uh, for corn ethanol to run vehicles. And that's assuming only that only 13% of the corn is irrigated, which is current, the current average. So these are huge water consumers. Hydroelectric actually consumes a lot of water because of evaporation. 
on the surface, but we're not looking to add much uh, hydroelectric. The thermal power plants, nuclear and coal with carbon capture, they also take some water. Car uh, CC, uh, CSP, concentrated solar, you can actually do it either with water cooling or air cooling. If you use air cooling, which so you don't require any of this water, you lose about three or four percent efficiency. So it's not too bad of a penalty to use air cooling, which you probably want to do in desert areas where there's not a lot of water. But the rest of these, like wind, takes virtually no water, except wind with hydrogen fuel cell vehicles takes some water for the high, because you need uh, to electrolyze water, and so you need water for that, but it's not a huge amount. Okay, so let's um, look at the overall rankings of these energy technologies and put them in context. So we recommend uh, kind of the wind, water, and sun technologies including wind, concentrated solar, geothermal, tidal, photovoltaic, wave, and hydroelectricity. And for vehicles, these electric power options powering battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Now we don't recommend these other ones, not because they're not better than what we currently have. In fact, many of them are better than what we currently have. It's just that they're not so good as these. And so it's an opportunity cost. If we already have existing technologies that are better, we should use those to as much as possible uh, before even considering these other ones. But right now we're spending a lot of money on these other ones. So nuclear and coal with carbon capture are not recommended or needed. Corn cellulosic ethanol or sugarcane ethanol or soy or algae biodiesel are not needed. Um, and so we don't recommend those. And again, it's not because they might not be better than what we currently have, it's just that they're not so good as these. And so it's an opportunity cost and therefore a waste of resources. And we don't really have time to fiddle around trying to, uh, trying to see if something is going to work if, or you know, it's something, an interim type of technology. If you, if, you, if you spend money on an interim technology that's going to be sitting around for 20 or 30 years, uh, then that's basically uh, lots of emissions that are going to uh, go into the system and it'll, take, it'll be harder to uh, fix the problem because you've lost a lot of money spending, spent on those. Now let's look at using these technologies to power the entire world on renewables. Well today, uh, the end use power demand is 12.5 terawatts for all purposes. Uh, the global power demand in 2030 with current fuels is anticipated to be 16.9 terawatts. But if we go to electricity and hydrogen for all purposes, then our power demand goes down to 11 and a half terawatts. This is not because of energy efficiency, except in the, to the extent that electric vehicles, for example, are much more efficient than internal combustion vehicles. The plug to wheel efficiency of an electric vehicle is on the order of, of 75 to 86%, and whereas internal combustion is generally 17 to 20 or 25%. And so just by using electricity instead of combustion, you reduce your power demand. And you know, hydrogen is a little bit more efficient than uh, internal combustion. It's, a less, it's less efficient than electricity. Uh, so anyway, when you crunch the numbers, you end up with about 11 and a half terawatts or a 30% reduction in power demand just going, by going to electricity and hydrogen. So what, here's one scenario in powering the world with renewable energy. Uh, using 50% wind and 40% solar. And so why do you ask, do we ha is it 50% wind and 40% solar and not more solar than wind or why not more geothermal than wind or something like that? Well. There's more, the, we'll see that the technology or the energy with the greatest resource is solar and wind is second in terms of recoverable uh, energy. And, but the cost of wind is less than solar. So because the cost of wind is less than solar, we expect it'll have more wind developed than solar. And, but there's enough solar and wind uh, to power the entire world multiple times over. And those are the only technologies that you can pull, power the world multiple, uh, multiple times over feasibly. Now, wave would only be about 1%, tidal about 1%, geothermal about 4%, hydroelectric 4%, and then um, of the solar, it'd be about 6% of the total energy would be solar rooftop, 14% would be solar PV, and 20% concentrated solar. So can we actually do this? So here's a wind resource analysis of the world that we did, looking at, well, do we have enough wind to power the world? And so this is modeling. We also did a data analysis and it came out with similar numbers. Uh, but if we look at all wind power worldwide, there are about 1,700 terawatts of delivered power, well, which is not a realistic number because we'd start interfering with, 
uh, at that, that penetration, we'd get less due to the interference of wind turbines with, another, with other ones and slow down the winds slightly, but we only need to power about 11 and a half terawatts. So all wind over land and high wind locations outside Antarctica are about 70 to 170 terawatts. And the power demand in 2030 is about 17 terawatts. So we have at least five to 10 times more wind power than we need in developable locations uh, to power the world. Now with solar, there's even more, 6,500 terawatts worldwide, all solar over land and high solar locations, about 340 terawatts. And again, world power demand is about 17 terawatts in 2030. So we have even more solar available than wind. Well, okay, the biggest issue people ask is, well, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So how do we uh, match, how do we deal with the variability of the wind? So here are six ways to do that. Uh, and I'll show you an example of at least one of them. So interconnecting geographically dispersed wind, water, and sun resources. So it turns out, well, at one location, the winds don't always blow in the ants, but if you actually look at locations that are farther, farther apart, like 100 to 300 kilometers, uh, then you can smooth out the winds because if the winds aren't blowing in one place, they're generally blowing somewhere else in a general vicinity. However, you do get these high pressure systems that slow down the winds everywhere, and so we have to deal with those as well. But this does smooth out the overall uh, supply. So if we bundle wind, water, and sun resources as one commodity using hydroelectricity to fill in gaps in supply, this actually uh, can go a long way towards uh, matching supply with demand hour by hour. And I'll show you an example of that in the next uh, slide. But using demand response management where uh, you, the utility will give incentives financial incentives for people not to use power at peak times of the day, uh, you can also use that as well. And you can oversize peak generation capacity, so put up more wind farms than you need for the electricity, and then use the extra electricity to produce hydrogen, which we'll need for commercial processes and transportation and other things as well. Uh, we can store electric power on site or in battery electric vehicles is another option, although I don't think we'll even need to get to there. Uh, and forecasting winds and clouding is better to reduce reserve requirements is another way to uh, make the whole system more efficient. So let me show an example of combining resources together to match power supply with demand. So uh, this is work by uh, Elaine Hart, a graduate student who's, uh, she looked at two years, 2005 and 2006 in California, uh, every hour. So this shows two particular days, the hourly, Power demand is the black line. And then we used, uh, just increased the geothermal power uh, supply slightly. Did not, did not change the hydroelectric supply in California, but increased the wind and solar at existing sites that we had data for, wind speed data and solar data for. And the, the yellow is solar photovoltaics. The orange is uh, concentrated solar, which has a little bit of storage as you can see here. And so, what she found was that if you combine wind, which is this blue, and the solar, the orange and the yellow, and fill in the gaps with hydroelectric, and this is existing hydroelectric, we're not increasing it, we can match hourly power demand, hour by hour, almost every hour over a two year period. In fact, 99.8% of the hours uh, were carbon free. This gray is the backup, which is natural gas, which was hardly ever used, only 0.2% of the hours of the year. Uh, and this is with no demand response or without oversizing or without any of the other techniques that we uh, discussed. So we think it is feasible by combining renewables together optimally to actually match this power demand. Okay, so this is also um, caught on in, in Europe where, so Europe has a plan to build the super grid. And so this is also an idea floating somewhat in the US to expand the grid because you if you want something like this to work on a large scale, you really need to interconnect geographically dispersed wind, water, and solar resources together. So in Europe, there's a lot of sunlight in the Sahara and there's wind along the, in the Sahara. The blue, blue is wind and the kind of red is solar. 
and there's uh, hydroelectric uh, in northern Europe, and there's also lots of wind in northern Europe. And so this would be all interconnected through a grid. And so basically taking wind, water, and sun uh, resources, connecting them, smoothing out, or, or being able to try to match supply with demand on a large scale, on a continental scale. So this requires cooperation. Something like this uh, would work in the US and North America as well. Um, but the barrier is getting people to agree to do it and you know, to actually increase their transmission capacity. And okay, just a couple more short issues. Uh, one is materials. So we looked at materials needed for this. And in this particular one, where neon uh is used in permanent magnets uh, for wind turbine generators. And so the reserve base worldwide is about 27.3 uh, teragrams of, and, but we only need about 4.4 teragrams to power 50% of the world with wind, 3.8 million five megawatt wind turbines. So we don't think this rare earth element is a limiting factor. Uh, with lithium, so here's uh, underneath the salt flats in Bolivia, just by a few feet is, a, is our lithium reserves. And the world lithium base over land, at least 11 teragrams, but they're also in Argentina and Afghanistan, there are additional reserves, but we don't know how much. But at least this 11 teragrams can produce 1.1 billion vehicles worth of lithium, and there are currently 800 million vehicles in the world. And the oceans contain another 240 uh, teragrams of lithium. Now, in terms of costs, well, we'll start with transmission costs. So we analyzed the cost of long distance transmission. Short distance transmission is not such a big deal, but long distance transmission, if you use high voltage direct current, uh, we estimate the median range for 1,200 to 2,000 kilometer transmission is about an additional 1.2 cents per kilowatt hour, but there's a big range here. But the 1.2 cents a kilowatt hour that compares, well, I'll show you the cost of electricity um, today from, from conventional sources, it's about seven cents a kilowatt hour without externalities. The externalities uh, in the US are another five cents a kilowatt hour. So it's a total of conventional electricity today is about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. And in 2030, it's expected to go up to a total 13.5. But people re really only look at the seven or eight cents a kilowatt hour, not the externality cost, which, but you need to look at these externalities. So the cost of wind onshore today are four to seven cents a kilowatt hour. Offshore, it's more expensive, 10 to 17. Wave power is pretty expensive. Geothermal is about four to seven cents. Hydroelectric, about four cents. Concentrated solar, about 11 to 15 cents. And solar PV, greater than 20 cents. And tidal, greater than 11. Now, these costs are expected to go down even further in 2020 to 30. And so right now, wind, onshore wind, and geothermal and hydro are competitive with conventional. The others are more expensive, uh, but they don't have the externality costs associated with them. And in 2020 to 30, we expect that all these, the cost of these other technologies will come down uh, further. So they'll even be directly competitive with conventional sources. Uh, but when you count the externalities, they're already improving uh, society. So to summarize, in 2030, the electricity costs are expected to be 4 to 10 cents a kilowatt hour for most technologies and 8 to 13 cents for some uh, wind, water, and solar uh, technologies versus fossil fuels, which will be about 13.5 cents uh, if you include all the externality costs. Uh, if you include long distance, this includes long distance transmission, which is about one cent a kilowatt hour. This, the total land use required for this, the additional land use required beyond what we currently use, is about 0.4% of the world's land for the footprints and about 0.6% for spacing. So maybe 1% total. But with the spacing, you can use that land also for other purposes, such as agriculture, a range land, open space. Uh, that compares with about 40% of the world's land today is used for cropland and pasture. So it's pretty trivial additional land to power the entire world and eliminate two and a half to three million air pollution deaths per year and eliminate global warming and provide energy stability. And then finally, um, converting to wind, water, and sunlight, WWS and electricity hydrogen will reduce global power demand by about 30%. Uh, there are several methods of reducing or addressing the wind, water, and sun variability issue to try to match power demand with supply. 
Um, we don't think materials are limits, although recycling may be needed. And the barriers, there are upfront costs, transmission needs, and then there's all, all sorts of lobbying by these technologies that uh, don't, aren't included in politi politics, of course. So that's all I have to say. So I uh, welcome any questions. Do mind control of the questions? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, why don't you start back there? Yeah, I, uh, I've been hearing of presentations over the past few weeks from uh, GM about the bolts and, and been learning about plug-in hybrids. Um, but it seems to me it might be difficult to, to roll those out in the emerging markets where you know, it's not, people don't have you know, their own garage, but they can put in a 240 volt charger. So do you, do you see any barriers to, to rolling out battery vehicles and, and plug-in hybrids in, in you know, India and China and these countries where a lot of people don't have their own homes? No, I don't. Well, there are companies that that's their business to try to make it easier for people to charge. Better Place is one of them. And they've gone into some, a couple countries, three countries at least, to try to test out methods of, of simplifying charging. You don't necessarily need to charge in your home. I mean, we have, right now, I mean, the people drive gasoline vehicles all over the world or diesel vehicles because they have uh, gas stations. So you can also imagine having charging stations where people go to charge their cars too. Um, there's, there are going to be challenges because if it takes a long, uh, if you don't have a fast charger, uh, there will certainly be challenges. But it doesn't mean that there, there aren't solutions as well. Um, I mean, people do live in, even in apartment complexes, they have to park their car somewhere. So how, you can have charging stations on the streets, for example. And that's one plan is to just having, you know, like, like you have a parking meter, you have a charging station, you just plug your car in every time you park. And you audit, you have a credit card of some kind that pays for it. There are many options. I don't claim to know all of them, but I don't think that's a major barrier. Yeah, go back. And then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, Denmark has about 30% of its capacity from wind, and they've actually used a similar method uh, from hydro in Sweden and Norway. But if you look at the, the actual load capacity of wind, uh, they only generate about 5 to 10 percent of the actual energy that they use, so they've tended to backfill with natural gas in the North Sea um, to the point where they haven't actually reduced their carbon footprint despite being the most green country on the planet. Why would this be any different? Well, because we wouldn't be using natural gas, we'd be using more solar instead and ramp up the hydro and the wind. Wind power seems to have uh, gas power plants that can be turned on instantly to provide you know, a base load when the wind's not blowing, even though they have an internet, interconnected power grid. So why would it be any different? Is it the solar factor that they don't have? Well, that's where we, I showed an example that we didn't need the natural gas backup. I mean, those back, we had the back, natural gas backup in case we needed it. It turned out we only needed it 0.2% of the hours of the year. Right, that's the, the theory behind it. Denmark has actually been trying this for the no, past 30 because they don't years. have the solar. There's they don't have the solar component of it. So the solar is the missing component. Then. Yeah, and also the the wind, uh, also the hydro. They could ramp up the hydro use as well. It's really you've got to make everything renewable first. Well, not first, but you have to plan the entire system together and optimize it. I mean, they're going on with existing generators, which are you know some coal, some nuclear, some natural gas. So they're just working with what they have. If you change what you have, then you can optimize that grid. So they don't have a lot of solar in Europe right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you give us a range on the bar with uh, 11 and a half terawatts here, but population <coughs> growth, tiny middle class here, but energy efficient light bulbs and buildings? Kind of what would make it uh, much higher or lower? Well, so that was, yeah, 11 and a half would be in 2030, so certainly in 2050 that will be even higher. Uh, well, we anticipate that there's going to be, you know, there are higher, there's going to be higher population, more power demand, so let's say that goes up to 15 terawatts. But the, we haven't reached the limit of the resources or even close to it, so there is room for even expansion beyond the 11 and a half terawatts, a lot of room. I don't know what that limit is, but there's a lot of room. 
Let me go back. Mark, instead of only looking at the average production cost of electricity, did you also look at the investments that are required to transform the energy system? Uh, just at the surface, we didn't. Yeah, we didn't go into um, the time-dependent changes so much. But yeah, you need a, a lot of upfront costs and investments. Well, we're looking at to try to replace all existing all new well to have all new energy by 2030 and replace all existing energy by 2050. So there is time to kind of implement this with you know, if you invested a certain amount each year. But uh, that would be a good project for somebody to continue working on this. We haven't quite done it. One more question. Uh, well, I'll take two more. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was just wondering if you're working with other parts of uh, Stanford who focus on uh, political processes to cause this to become some sort of reality. Um, not formally, but uh, informally, certainly we've had a lot of conversations with people who, about how to, and yeah, a lot of groups have contacted us about how to implement. So we, yeah, we've worked, in fact, with the German government, people in the German government in Australia as well, and the European, par uh, European parliaments as well. So there are people who are taking parts of the plan and trying to implement it. And in fact, Europe has a plan to go 80% renewable by 2050, so it's, we're 100 percent, but they're you know 80 percent is not too bad of a goal. Maybe one other question. I get in the back. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about the converting from gasoline-powered electric or vehicle fleet to a electric or ethanol fleet. Um, I wanted to know, other than the fact that the electric vehicle is more efficient than a gasoline vehicle, what are the other assumptions that you put into that slide? Um, sorry, that's assumptions about the electric. There, I mean, there are a lot. There's a well. There's a whole spreadsheet of of calculations I can point you to. In fact, yeah. I mean, I could if you send me an email. It's probably the easiest I can actually point you to a, a spreadsheet. That's yeah, probably too many things to explain right here. Things about charging at night and things like that. Um, yeah. Well, charging at night would be optimal because that's the price of electricity is lowest. For most people, and also it it would help if people charge at night because that's when wind often peaks. So we can ramp up the wind use for to meet that demand. So, yeah. So the Stanford Energy Club will be holding an energy social outside in the lobby for students and faculty to attend. And let's thank Professor Jacobs. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.